And now, America's number one show on pop culture and politics. This is the Michael Medved Show. And another great day in this greatest nation on God's green earth. And what a great day it is. Uh, We um, are able to announce that something that happened yesterday has already rocked the whole world. Now, what was it? Was it uh, President Obama's uh, unbelievable speech in Berlin? In what sense was it unbelievable? Well, we talked about, no, that happened today, actually. And no, it didn't rock the world, though it may have rocked some people to sleep. No, something that happened yesterday that has already rocked the world is the publication of what is destined to be one of the most discussed, most important, most revelatory books of the year. It is called Darwin's Doubt. It is uh, written by my friend Stephen Meyer. Uh, Stephen is a senior fellow at the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute. And here's something. It's pretty amazing. The book was officially published yesterday. It's brand new. And immediately, it uh, debuted as the number one bestseller of any book at any form on barnesandnoble.com. And um, it's number one on Amazon's biology, evolution, and cosmology lists. It's been as high as number five on Amazon's overall bestseller list. Uh, Stephen, okay, I'm going to ask you the question you weren't expecting. What is it about this book? that you think is connecting with people so much so that they're rushing out and buying it. Well, you do talk radio and a lot of the things you address are political. And, uh, but you also know that underlying the cultural issues that we have, there's a deep worldview divide in the culture. And the question of biological origins is a question that speaks to those competing worldviews that are in play in the culture. Every worldview has to answer the question, what is the thing or the entity from which everything else came? And the Darwinian account for the last 150 years has been essentially a materialistic account that everything comes from a an unguided evolutionary process involving essentially matter in motion, natural selection acting on random genetic mutations. But people sense, I think, at the core that there's something more than just that uh, behind life. And I think there is an interest in these deeper uh, worldview or metaphysical questions in the culture. And uh, I think you know, you, you've you tapped into that in some of the previous shows we've done with you. So, um, Well, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you about it, and congratulations on the very early success of the book. Stephen Meyer, of course, received his Ph.D. from the University of Cambridge in the philosophy of science after uh, working as a geophysicist for the oil industry, and he is all about, in this book and his previous bestseller, and it was a bestseller, A Signature in the Cell, he's all about trying to ask the devastating questions that nobody wants to ask. Now, this this gets to a very important point, and it was something that struck me as I was looking through your book, uh, Stephen, is that uh, we're generally told that you have to be an idiot to question any aspect of Darwinian evolution. But the first person to question it was somebody who I think we'd agree was no idiot, His name was Charles Darwin. Darwin himself. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so what did Darwin question about his own account? Well, the Darwin's Doubt, the title of the book, refers to something that he acknowledged in The Origin of Species that troubled him, which was the sudden appearance, the abrupt appearance of the major groups of animals, the first appearance of animals in the fossil record. Whereas he envisioned that the history of life was a gradual unfolding from very simple one-celled organisms to all the forms we see today— uh, such that you could depict the history of life as a kind of gradual branching tree. What the fossil record showed instead was something more like a lawn or an orchard of separate trees where all the major groups of animals appeared abruptly with no connections at the base, um, tying it all together in the, in the manner he envisioned. So that was, he said, a, a, a valid, the, the, the Cambrian explosion of animal life, as it was called, uh, he acknowledged was a valid objection to the views here entertained, as he put it in his Victorian uh, language. And uh, how have uh, Darwin's followers answered that valid objection? Well, that's really the story of the book. It's the the story of the book is Darwin's doubt and what became of it. And I unfold the story as a kind of mystery story. There's two aspects to the mystery. One is the mystery of the ancestral fossils, the ancestral precursors that Darwin expected to find in the lower Precambrian layers of rock that have not ever materialized. And the second story, the second mystery is the probably even more profound engineering question of how do you build complex animals given that these things arise so quickly and that the Darwinian mechanism requires by the logic of Darwinism itself a great deal of time to work. 
I, I was telling you during the break, and and this is when you talk about how do you build a, an an organism. Um, we went, my wife and I, we were uh, spent uh, the, our Sabbath in uh, in Washington D.C. and 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 went and uh, listened uh, to a, a conference in the first part of the day on Saturday. And the second part of the day, we walked over to the National Museum of Natural History, which is right on the mall. It's a Smithsonian institution, federally funded. And they happen to have this huge new exhibit about the human genome. And they, they had something there that just blew me away. And it, it's, they uh, basically showed what a, um, uh, a page of a genomic code would look like. And then they asked the question, how many of those pages together would you need to put together to equal the amount of code behind one human being? And it's actually enough pages so that if you stack them one on top of the other, it would be as high as the Washington Monument. A lot fatter than my book. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. No. <laughs> yes, even as high as the Washington Monument. It's, it's, it's thousands it's, and thousands of pages. It's unbelievable. The, it reams of information. And this, this is, this is one of the main themes of the book is that the origin of animals is not just the origin of form or structure or new, new sophisticated organs like compound eyes, which you find in trilobites right from the very dawn of animal life. But it's also an information explosion because we know to build an animal requires new types of cells. New types of cells in turn require new proteins. And proteins are built in accord with the instructions stored in the DNA molecule. So when we look at these new forms of animal life, we now understand that this explosion of animal life is also an explosion of information. And that's the central question of the book. Where does that information come from? And can the blind, unguided process of mutation and natural selection build that amount of information, let alone in the, in the very brief amount of time available to the process? 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. If you think all of this is uh, a bunch of gobbledygook to hide ignorant prejudices and old caveman-like religious suppositions, <laughs> well, you're wrong and you don't know Steve Meyer. But you can get to know him by getting your very own copy of Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. Uh, Stephen, this is, what a, this, there's so much that is so profound and so important here. I am... Um, I get into conversations all the time. I always have, but now since we're doing these regular science and culture updates with Discovery Institute, more than ever before. Well, and your, your father was a prominent scientist too, so he he had a lot of interest in these questions. Didn't he, he? he did, and he was so sympathetic. He supported your work, and he came to it uh, not not through his religious investigations, but through scientific mm -hmm. investigations and some of the revelations about the nature of DNA. Which of of course are are so profoundly involved in the new book Darwin's Doubt, but what I was going to get to, and I, I think it's it's very basic. Um, I was asked by a friend who's of course ridiculing any questions about Darwinism at all. He says, "Okay, when they are able to create life in the laboratory, will then you recognize that all this stuff about intelligent design is stupid?" I said, "Wait a minute." If they're able to create life in the laboratory, who, all it will show is, you know, who designed it? Who's it the didn't they? just happen, yeah, who's, right? Who's the, the they is some designers. <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, uh, what what do uh, – because you deal with this all the time. This is your life. It's your bread and butter. You have the Cambrian explosion, and all of a sudden there are how many new life forms it really very quickly – well, there are at least 20 new phyla, but that's the largest division of life. And within that, you have subphyla and classes. So there, there's, there's literally hundreds of new forms of animal life that, that occur very abruptly in the, in the fossil record. Why? Well, that's the big question of the book. You know, it, can that be explained by the unguided, undirected process of mutation and selection? Or is some kind of intelligence necessary to explain, for example, the, the reams of information that come online when the animal forms come online? Okay. And one more question. And you'll, I'll give you a chance to respond to this after the break and we'll take calls for Stephen Meyer, author of Darwin's Doubt. One of the things that was struck me going through this exhibit at the National Museum of mm -hmm. Natural History was, uh, okay, you have a mutation. A, a single mutation is really doesn't do you a lot of good unless there are a bunch of them that are exactly the same, right? Well, the mutations have to be coordinated to build something yeah, fundamentally otherwise, new. Yeah, otherwise it's not right, passed right. on. 
we, we're we're out here in in Microsoft country, and uh, there's an awful lot of uh, programmers that we know who are very skeptical about Darwinism. And some of the earliest scientific skepticism came from computer scientists and mathematicians at MIT, because they realized that if DNA c- contains code. If you start changing that code randomly, you're much more likely to degrade the code than to build anything fundamentally new. This is so important. We will get to more with Stephen Meyer. The book is called Darwin's Doubt. Get it. It's up at our website at michaelmedved.com. 530 million years ago, the previously empty seas of the Cambrian era suddenly erupted with diverse forms of animal life. It was the most fantastic, mysterious event in Earth's history, the Cambrian Explosion. Left behind in the fossil record was a riddle that troubled Charles Darwin himself. A mystery surrounding this explosion of life, which has led to the steady unraveling of Darwin's evolutionary theory. Darwin's Doubt, a revolutionary new book by Dr. Stephen Meyer, makes the most compelling, controversial, yet scientifically rigorous case yet to be offered for the intelligent design of life. Praised by scientists at Harvard, the University of Georgia, and the State University of New York, Darwin's Doubt is on sale now. Buy the book that will change your ideas about life and life's origins forever. For more details and to get your copy of Darwin's Doubt, go to darwinsdoubt.com. That's darwinsdoubt.com. Twenty-one minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved show, where you can save fifteen percent or even more on car insurance with Geico. Just go to Geico.com or call one eight hundred nine four seven Auto. The only hard part is figuring out which way is even easier. You know what's fascinating about this? This whole uh, Geico company, it uh, it emerged randomly. I mean, out of out of nothing. No one planned it. It just Boom. It just developed and now people save lots of money on car insurance. I'm, of course, I'm speaking with Stephen Meyer. He's the author of Darwin's Doubt. And the, the core of Darwin's Doubt and the core of the book is n- not that Stephen Meyer has every question wrapped up and tied up with little ribbon and how did all this stuff happen and why did it happen and when did the dinosaurs go away and, uh, when and why did life suddenly explode in what's called the Cambrian explosion? And, and by the way, nobody doubts that there was a Cambrian explosion, do they? No, I, I, there was, there were, have been various attempts to explain it away as an artifact of incomplete sampling in the fossil record or incomplete preservation of certain kinds of forms. And those, I, I addressed that in the first part of the book. And those artifact hypotheses, as they, they, they're called, have gradually gone by the boards and leading, two Cambrian leading authorities, uh, Doug Irwin and James Valentine have a book coincidentally out this spring on the Cambrian explosion and they argue very strenuously that the explosion is real it's not an artifact of sampling it's something that has to be explained and do they have an explanation uh they have an approach that they are recommending which is to try to bring information from different scientific fields together in a more interdisciplinary approach to try to explain it but in the end they say that the event is non-uniformitarian which is code in a sense scientific lingo for saying that the event cannot be explained by reference to any known biological process that we see observe and can observe in the world today so it's a it's a it's a really a profound mystery in fact the review of their book in science just a week ago uh said that the puzzle of the cambrian explosion surely must rank as one of the most important outstanding mysteries in evolutionary biology the mystery explored in some depth in uh, the book Darwin's Doubt. It comes complete with some full color and very handsome illustrations. And, of course, the elegant writing of my guest, Stephen Meyer, in this science and culture update. Let's go to Brian in Louisville, Kentucky. Brian, you're on the MedVed Show with Stephen Meyer. Hey, Michael. Hey. Michael, I'm a long-time listener, first-time caller, and I just want you to know I, I love your show. Thank you. And I, I agree with you about 99% of the time. And I, I appreciate your, your pursuit of truth and, and your elegant way of, of going about that. Well, so. thank you. But I have a, I have a sort of a sense that you, we don't agree right now. There's a bridge <laughs> yeah. too far. Well, no, it's, it's not that we don't agree. It's, I'm going to pose a couple questions to Stephen here and then I'll, I'll hang up unless you want to keep me on talking. No, about we want to keep you on. Go. Okay. Well, first of all, when you say abruptly, I think he needs to explain to the audience what exactly abruptly means, because I think there's a lot of people out there who think, oh, you know, that's a year or five years or a hundred years. I mean, 
talking, you know, from pre-Cambrian to Cambrian, we're talking, you know, tens of thousands of years from a great, you know, moving from pre-Cambrian to Cambrian. Well, a- actually, number- it's, it's quite a bit more than that. The explosion well, takes pl- takes place in a period of time of about five to ten million years, probably okay. within five to six. That supports my and, argument even more. Well, it actually doesn't because it's, uh, it, I mean, it, 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 your narrow point is correct. But the broader point is that the explosion is not only bo- uh, geologically sudden in that when you go up the rock column, you, these these things appear abruptly with no uh, apparent ancestors in the lower strata. But the explosion is also biologically sudden in that it occurs suddenly in relation to how fast the Darwinian mechanism works, or really rather how slowly it works. There's a subdiscipline of of evolutionary theory known as population genetics, and it is actually allows evolutionary biologists to calculate how much change should take place if we know things like the mutation rate, the generation time, the size of populations, and the like. And the the amount of time required to produce very minor changes is now uh, like changes in genes or proteins. Uh, scientists are calculating the waiting times associated with those very minor changes, and they're getting waiting times that run well beyond the length of the time that life has been on Earth. When you look at something like the Cambrian explosion, where you're not just looking at a new gene or protein, but a whole new complex animal, the waiting time is incalculable. And so this is, it is... And when you, when you say incalculable, you're talking billions. We're talking ab- big exponential numbers that run longer than the, than the age of the Earth. And and so the, 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 you have to, you, you, yes, you have millions of years at your disposal, but five or ten million years is a blink of the eye in comparison to the, the time required to generate new forms of life using the standard mechanisms. Brian, you want to continue? All right, yeah, I'm no scientist, but I'm going to throw this at you. I mean, <laughs> no pun intended with what I'm about to say. Um Explain to the audience what you think about meteors and comets, asteroids that collide with the Earth and bring to the Earth uh, different kinds of elements, molecules, proteins, so on and so forth from other worlds and other parts of the solar system, bringing that to Earth, therefore planting a seed, and the elements are right, and it explodes. So, you know, this whole thing about, you know, intelligent design, okay, I buy that to some degree, but you have to account for the fact that something was brought to this. If it didn't, if it didn't originate on this earth, as you're implying, something had to have been brought to this earth. Have you not, have you not thought about or investigated the possibility that an asteroid or a comet or Something impacted the Earth and brought those elements here. Very interesting question, Stephen. Well, it's not, that supposition. I, I do think life originated on Earth. Uh, the 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 supposition that uh, some of the building blocks of life were brought to the Earth from uh, extrasolar objects uh, is more relevant to the topic of the origin of the very first life, which was the subject of my first book. But all those proposals involve building blocks of fundamental molecules. They don't involve information-rich DNA that is ready, locked and loaded to, to build an organism. So getting from, from the constituent parts of, uh, of uh, information containing biomolecules to the molecules with the information they contain is a big jump. And that's not provided just by bringing in some amino acids from outer space or something like that. It'd be the difference between a pile of Scrabble letters and uh, a Shakespearean play. You've got to arrange the, the constituents to form the information-rich molecules. Brian, first of all, I want to salute you for um, being interested, intrigued, fascinated by this subject. And I want to challenge you. Uh, take a look at the book. I, I, I think you will, you will find it. It's not tendentious. It doesn't try to say, I know it all. I'm, I'm, I've got all the answers. What it does, it, it, it asks a series of questions that I think can increase people's sense of wonder about the world in which we live. And yes, we'll raise even more questions about how that world came into being. Brian, thanks so much for your call and your kind words about our work here. When we come back, I, I want to talk about what all of this means for the whole all of the assumptions that are based on neo-Darwinism. If uh, you're right about the Cambrian explosion and unanswered questions, then who's wrong and about what and why? Coming up. 
Portions of The Michael Medved Show are brought to you in part by the Discovery Institute. To learn more, click on the Science and Culture banner at michaelmedved.com. Minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved show with uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer. He is the author of uh, yet another uh, triumphant bestseller. And the book is called Darwin's Doubt. He is, of course, a senior fellow at the Science and Culture uh, Institute at, uh, at the Science and Culture Center at Discovery Institute. One of the things that's fascinating about this, uh, this book, and I was kind of stunned by it to pick it up, is... Um, the uh, the endorsements on the back of the book are, for instance, uh, from a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, at um, by a, a senior scientist at the um, Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research, which is a prestigious institution, from a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at University of Georgia, by a professor of biology at the State University of New York, a very, very well-known people with terrific scientific credentials saying that, hey, you've got to read this book. This is important. It's well-argued. So how is it that there are people, well, like the, the exhibit we saw at the National uh, Museum of Natural History, Federal Dollars at Work, where they have a huge plaque before you even go into the exhibit about human origins about uh, natural selection and Darwinism. And it says all reputable scientists universally accepted. Uh, and basically they're saying, D don't believe any of that intelligent design stuff. It, it all just happened. How, how is it that people can actually claim that when here, just the evidence of lifting up your book, Darwin's doubt, it's not true. Well, it's not just the book. It's what's in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. This is one of the one of the themes of the book. Actually, I strike it early, and it's based on some experiences that I've had. I was testifying at a state board of education hearing in 2009, and it was in the great state of Texas. And the board there was investigating, or was was it was debating a proposal to allow students to teach to learn about the strengths and weaknesses of all scientific theories. And the Darwin-only scientific lobby turned out in force and said, well, you can't apply that standard to Darwinian evolution because there, quote, are no weaknesses in evolutionary <laughs> theory. I presented into evidence a binder of 100 peer-reviewed scientific articles from leading scientists who are raising questions about weaknesses in Darwinian evolution. And in the book, I, I, I explain that there's a huge disparity now between what I call the public defenders of of Darwin, Darwin's public defenders, this, the, the people who are spokesmen for the, the theory and what they say about the status of the theory and what's actually going on even in the field of evolutionary biology where leading evolutionary theorists are acknowledging that uh, there, there are serious problems and some are now calling for a new theory of evolution and even many who aren't calling for such a theory are furiously working on formulating new theories because they know that the mutation and selection mechanism does not have the creative power necessary to build, for example, fundamentally new animal body plans such as a rise in the Cambrian period. Let's go to Greg in uh, Tampa, Florida. Greg, you're on the Michael Medved Show with Dr. Stephen Meyer. Uh, thanks for taking my call. You um, bet. I happen to be an evolutionary biologist, so I had one. I had a couple of questions, actually. Good. First of all, I was wondering um, for your guest, when exactly in, uh, does he say the Cambrian explosion begins, and what organisms are included in that? All animals. Uh, uh, the that all animals appear at that point? No, the, uh, uh, the Cambrian begins about, uh, the, the main pulse of the explosion of the radiation begins about 530 million years. And most geochronologists date the, the main pulse of, in, in, as an event of about five to six million. And the, in the book, I have a, a table based on a lot of research we did. And we show that there are about, um, 20 of the main file, there are about 36 file in the history of life by, by one way of counting. And uh, 10 of them 
are not represented in the fossil record anywhere. So of the 26 phyla that are represented in the fossil record, about 20 first appear in the Cambrian. So, well, uh, a, 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 a big majority of those represented first appear. Now, you, of course, know that the phyla are um, the phyla classification. Yeah, it's a cli- whole, part of the classification. Yeah. yeah, it's the biggest division in in the biological classification okay, so system. Did you want to follow up, Greg? I, I do actually, because there are major groups of animals that appear way, way before the Cambrian explosion. So I'll, I'll give you some examples. There are molecular clock dates that tell us, which we can get from DNA itself, that tell us that sponges, which are a type of animal, and they might be as old as eight, around 850 million years, which is quite a bit earlier than the Cambrian explosion. Uh, sponge chemical fossils may be as old as 720 million. Sponge body fossils, 620 million years um, ago. Okay, uh, uh, Greg, we have to go to a break for just a moment. Please do hang on, and we'll get we'll get uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer's response. His new book is called Darwin's Doubt, but have no doubt there will be a response. There will be a response to ancient sponges coming up. The Michael Medved Show. MichaelMedved.com Forty-four minutes after the hour on uh, the Michael Medved Show where uh, you can sign up to uh, have full access to our show at our um, um, MedHead uh, Musing Center as a MedHead member uh, at michaelmedved.com. And uh, guess what? It costs about 20 cents a day. Well worth it. Gives you all sorts of exclusive content and access to everything that goes on with this show. Check it out at michaelmedved.com. And you can also find information there about... Stephen Meyer's new book, a highly provocative, widely acclaimed, an instant bestseller. It is called Darwin's Doubt. Uh, Stephen was just dealing with a challenge from Greg, who's an evolutionary biologist who called in from Tampa, Florida. Greg, you're still with us. I am. Okay. Your basic point is that uh, Stephen's book is all about the Cambrian explosion, which is the emergence in relatively short time, a short time that cannot be explained with normal Darwinian mechanisms of all kinds of new animal life forms. And you're saying that actually there were all kinds of forms of life that pre-existed the Cambrian explosion, to which Dr. Meyer says... Well, um, he's right in everything except the way you framed his uh, objection, all kinds. There are a few of the animal phyla that do first appear in the Precambrian, and he's correct, sponges are one of those forms. And uh, how far back they go depends on how uh, much weight scientists put on these molecular clock techniques that he's talking about. Uh, but I, I have a little chart in the book that shows that there are actually probably three of the animal phyla that appear in the Precambrian, but they're, they are not ancestral to the other 20 that first appear in the Cambrian. No one thinks, for example, a sponge is the ancestor of a, of a, comp- a much more complex form of animal called a, 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 the, an arthropod represented by, for example, a trilobite. Sponges have about six to 10 cell types, arthropods 60 to 90 or more. What's, what's a kind of arthropod <clears throat> that people would know? Well, um, all insects are arthropods. So, uh, and the the uh, trilobites, like modern insects, have um, uh, compound eyes from the very dawn of animal life. Fascinating level of complexity that that uh, appears very abruptly. So there, there's no evidence of compound eyes. Be- to 10 cell types, very simple. But they do they do go deeper into the record, a little bit deeper. I think the fossil evidence shows them going back to about 570 million. Your, get, your caller may disagree. But I, I address this in the book. The main, the main question, though, is the, the origin of all these forms that do not have ancestors at all deeper. And these, these first forms that appear first in the, in, the pre, in the late Precambrian themselves are a rather abrupt appearance, geologically speaking. Uh, I, uh, one other thing, just for your caller's sake, I do have a whole chapter on this uh, the use of of genes to date the the divergence points or the supposed common ancestors and uh, the, sometimes called the molecular clock or sometimes called the deep divergence hypothesis. I'm 
uh, at least partially skeptical about some of those methods because it's a kind of a, a garbage in, garbage out problem. The, the computer programs that analyze the similarities of genes presuppose that there is a common ancestor. So there's no way you can analyze these genes and not generate one. But the the, the dates they generate are so different from the fossil record that uh, there's a lot of skepticism about whether they're accurate. Greg, you want to follow up? Uh, yes, actually, there are complex worms, which are the ancestors to arthropods. In the Precambrian, they've been dated to about 585 million years, which, again, is still before. I, I want to make one other point, though. Well, I, I would agree I, that there's evidence of worms in the Precambrian, but I think the idea that they are ancestral to arthropods uh, okay, Rich, is, uh, go, is really debatable. Uh, go ahead, Greg, finish your point. Well, okay, I think it's a little disingenuous to say that scientists don't understand the Cambrian explosion, therefore creation. Um, how come there are not humans in the Cambrian or rabbits or trees or anything, any other kind of complex terrestrial life? Very uh, primitive. I, I, I'm not quite sure what your point would be there. I'm not arguing that uh, that scientists don't understand the Cambrian, therefore there's creation. I have a mm, different argument for intelligent design based on features of the Cambrian explosion and features of the animals that we know from experience arise from one and only one type of cause, that being intelligence. For example, the huge infusions of digital code that are necessary to build Cambrian animals I think provides a compelling indicator that intelligence was involved because what we know from experience from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, especially reasoning about the past, is that information arises from one and only one type of cause, and that cause is intelligence. So I think there's a positive argument for intelligent design to be made from certain features of the Cambrian. Um, okay, let, uh, yeah. Greg, response? Well, it still doesn't answer the question. I, I guess what I'm... What, 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 what question? What, yeah, I don't, I don't, question? Greg, I don't understand this because I think you misunderstand. The, the, the argument of intelligent design and the argument of the Cambrian explosion, explosion isn't that human beings and dinosaurs and everything evolved or all at once or developed all at once. It's just that if you are doing this in a sort of a progression using known Darwinian mechanisms, there's not enough time to explain the relatively abrupt emergence of all these new forms of animal life. So you're saying that there was a progression, just a magical progression by an intelligent designer? Not Well, magical is a pejorative term. I think there's evidence of design at certain points in the history of life. I've written two books about two such points in the history of life. One is the origin of the very first life, and that was what my first book, Signature in the Cell, was about. And this, uh, uh, this other point where I see definite evidence of design is in the origin of the animals, and that that's what the book's about. So I, I'm not attempting to give a comprehensive account or theory of everything, rabbits and humans and everything else, but I am saying that there are very intriguing indicators of a, a, a designing intelligence or a design process in the in, in the Cambrian explosion, one of one of which is information. Another is the, the the role that circuitry plays in the development of of animal forms. The other is the, the the hierarchical organization of information, which is something that we find in only one province of, uh, in our experience, and that again is in designed objects. Um, there's the the argument has a little more subtlety than I think you're likely to be assuming. Okay, so, uh, Greg, you get the very last word. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, in in terms of the information, I think scientists do have a good idea of how this is organized and how it evolves. It's through a process called Hox gene duplication and mutation. Okay, we will get to that and 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 more. And I still think, Greg, you're missing the point. You ought to take a look at this book. You'll find it challenging and interesting. It's called Darwin's Doubt. It's posted up at our website at michaelmedved.com. We'll be right back. Become a MedHead member today. Michael, I'm an enthusiastic fan of yours. I'm a MedHead. Commercial-free podcasts, commentaries, and musings. Find out more at michaelmedved.com. Fifty-five minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show. If you're at all intrigued by talk about uh, Darwin's Doubt, the new book by Stephen C. Meyer, one of the things that uh, has been made possible is for you to get a sample chapter. It's a full chapter. It's very challenging, and it's free. I mean, really costs you nothing. You can download it, and you can download it right away. You can download it at uh, michaelmedved.com. Just click on the uh, information there, 
on our website about Darwin's Doubt, and uh, or you can go directly to darwinsdoubt.com. It's a fascinating stuff, and uh, given the fact that they're making a, a full chapter available free to determine whether you're interested in the rest of the book, I think it's a, a vote of confidence in the importance and the accessibility of what Dr. Meyer is writing about. Let's go to Jim in Portland, Oregon. Jim, you're on the Michael Medved Show with Dr. Meyer. Hi, Michael. Hi, Stephen. <clears throat> uh, would, uh, if we emphasized, uh, uh, Epistemology, more you know, knowledgeology, if you will, wouldn't that uh, 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 sort out the controversies among these uh, theories? Well, it it might help. One of the I- I- issues in the, in philosophy of knowledge or epistemology that comes up is what what are the rules of science? And one of the things I take on in the end of the book is the idea that science must limit itself to strictly materialistic explanations of everything. Information is one of those things we know from experience doesn't come from undirected material processes. Rather, it comes from a mind. So when we encounter information, we ought to be able to explore the possibility that maybe a mind had a role. But there is a many scientists think that there is a rule of scientific investigation that precludes them or prohibits them from considering agency or mind or conscious activity as an explanation for certain types of phenomena. But I argue that that rule is actually intellectually limiting and we ought to be allowed to follow the evidence where it leads. Let's go quickly to Tom in Atlanta. You're on the Medved Show with Dr. Meyer. Uh, Yes, good afternoon. I I just wanted to make a point. I mean, I think the ID community has made some very interesting claims, namely that the uh, Darwin evolution has some flaws in it. And I think the uh, the guests have made a a great point in his book. Um, But I do want to make a point that, you know, this is still an evolutionist theory. And there's, uh, in my opinion, there should be a separation between the study of origin and science. Because I don't believe all these definitions are science topics at all. Uh, okay, Dr. Meyer. Um, uh, this uh, dep- Whether my theory of intelligent design is an evolutionary theory depends entirely on how you define evolution. Evolution has at least three meanings. One, change over time. Two, universal common ancestry. Three, the idea that the undirected process of mutation and selection explains it all. I'm skeptical of evolution number two and three, but not the idea of change over time. I think that's uh, non-controversial. So you're skeptical about a common ancestor, and you're co- uh, uh, the uh, very skeptical of the idea that undirected random. That's the main skepticism, exactly. Skepticism, usually not an unhealthy characteristic in this greatest nation on God's green earth. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. ID the Future is copyright Discovery Institute 2013. For more information, visit www.intelligentdesign.org or www.idthefuture.com.